Welcome, dear viewer, to part two of the Nevers finale. In part one of this Nevers season finale, I went ahead and talked about season 1A, recapped what happened in season 1B, and in this part we're going to talk about why the heck I summarized all that stuff, which characters I felt like were done right, which were done wrong, and just general decisions that were made in season 1B that were perplexing to me, along with maybe some things that I would have preferred. Again, it is worth noting that between season 1A and season 1B, B, the creative team changed dramatically. It's entirely possible that people didn't know where to go with those stories, what the original plan was, or even like what to do with these characters at all. It's also probable that during season 1B they realized this was going to be their only shot at creating any kind of finale. Their larger season crossing plans they had to scrap to give us anything that even kind of resembles a resolution. The results of the Nevers is incredibly disappointing and a lot of wasted potential, but I think most of the showrunners probably agree with this assessment based off of the passion and care and detail we saw in the first half of the season, compared to where things sort of end up in the back half. Maybe don't add characters in the last six episodes when you know you have to come to a full wrap. Some of the constant feedback I gave when I was live reviewing the first half of this season, there were so many characters and so many different plots going on, it was hard to keep track of and care about all of them. It often made me wonder like who I was supposed to be following or rooting for and like where those ideas were going, what we were going to do with them versus these other things. To that end, I do think that season 1B had an impossible task that we could have wrapped up the Nevers orphanage with the Nevers work camp with the Galanthi larger save the world plan with whatever the heck Malady was supposed to be doing with what the Lord Matheson and all the secret government people were planning with whatever the beggar king was doing with whatever the Ormen were doing with whatever the heck Augie was supposed to be doing in there like it was just too many characters too many threads all in there that couldn't come together in a neat little bow at the end. What season 1B chose to do was drop a lot of those things or sort of like force a bunch of stuff together that didn't necessarily fit well. They also for some reason added a whole new character that I just could never get on board with or understand. The character I'm talking about of course is the electric lady. We're introduced to her at the top of episode 7. We get a little Dr. Haig backstory which FYI I think ruins Dr. Haig's character entirely. Part of what I liked about him was he was like a fish out of water American scientist in a British show. I think we could have really leaned into that by making him be like the tr other traveler along with Zephyr or we could have leaned into it by having him just be sort of out of the box and not aligned with anyone else or we could have just like had some funny comedy comparing like Americanisms to traditional Britishisms but instead we established Dr. Haig as being part of like the British medical industry industry and him getting his license revoked because he's always been an oddball with crazy ideas about reviving his mom. I felt like the obsession with his mother was some low-hanging fruit. They could have built on it a little bit by like building on the relationship that Dr. Haig has with Larvinia. They don't do that. If you're gonna make him like a mama's boy obsessed lost in grief kind of person like really do that. But they just kind of want him to be quirky and funny and like not really understanding what's going on. Electric Lady herself we don't get a lot of. Apparently she's the other traveler who hitched a ride with Zephyr and the Galanthi. Her situation never makes a lot of sense to me. Like why didn't she hop into a recently deceased person the same way that Zephyr did? And then we don't have anywhere near enough time to kind of like build out her motivations or goals. We decide that she is bad because she is against the Galanthi, but as I said before, we don't really know what the Galanthi's goals are or how the Galanthi is going to achieve those goals, so it's very hard to decide Electric Lady is wrong. She's vaguely nefarious because she needs Dr. Haig to build a body for her, and they do that through unethical experimentation. But as an antagonist, she is incredibly lackluster. Four to five episodes is not enough time to build her a backstory. They just sort of have her like maniacally cackling, basically doing shorthand for 
her evilness. It goes entirely against the grain of like this complex like counter motive weaving that we were doing in the first half of the season where just because someone wasn't necessarily 100% aligned with you didn't mean they were against you. People had genuine reasons to feel afraid of certain things or to want certain goals that were opposed to our hero's goals. We hadn't really established that what the heroes wanted was necessarily a good thing. They just happened to be the characters we were going with at the time. And all of that like nuance and intricacy is just 100% dismissed. We can have someone that we don't even visually get to see be like an uber mega villain that's gonna come in on the back half of this. Another kind of time wasty thing they do in these back half of the episodes is they retcon a lot of the stuff that we had originally seen in the first half of the season. In episode 6, Zephyr plans to reveal to the orphanage exactly what's going on with the Galanthi and what her deal is. Let them in on everything so they can all come together and make like a cohesive plan. It'll take time to tell them everything. I was so excited with that line at the end of episode 6 because I wanted this ensemble cast of like super powered people. It even made me sort of put aside like my reservations about whether or not the Galanthi was good or bad or whether or not these people were secretly working to their own demise. All of this is immediately dashed when Penance comes in and tells Zephyr, Okay, time to tell everyone everything. I've got them together. And Zephyr's like, nah, that'll take too much time and we'll never get on the same page and we don't worry about anything and I just kind of need to do this thing my own way. We had already moved past this and now we're recycling this same old conversation. Instead of building on that and doing something, we're going to retread that story again in the last six episodes we're ever getting of the show. Another example of me of what might have been a retcon is Swan, Augie, and Larvinia's story. In the first six episodes, we saw that the three of them kind of all grew up together and played together and remembered a time when Larvinia didn't need the chair, all this kind of stuff. I thought based off of some of the clues about Swan having an older brother who had died at war and was like the father's favorite and did everything right while Swan was kind of like a degenerate. We're gonna find out that like maybe in a skating accident or some other kind of accident involving Augie and Swan and Larvinia that Swan was indirectly responsible for Larvinia's handicap. And that will also kind of explain why Larvinia accepts that Swan is still part of their life but also doesn't really like him that much. Larvinia is kind of like seen as a character that works with like a whole bunch of different people regardless and for whatever reason she just hates Swan and doesn't want to deal with him and I thought like this backstory was part of what was going to sort of wrap that all together. I thought we might even get a situation where Augie had been like manipulated to be quiet about the situation because he's so much younger than Larvinia and Swan and he doesn't 100% understand what's going on and instead of all of that we get just an Augie and Larvinia story story where Larvinia sees like this birdhouse that Augie has created, is disgusted by it randomly, burns it down, Augie in a fit of rage pushes her down some stairs. I hated everything about this true canon situation. Larvinia is like a pretty tough chick, independent, has her own mind, seems like even as a child she was into like hunting and boys things and sports. I don't feel like seeing a bunch of birds pinned up or like the insides of the birds with bone structures like all mapped that would necessarily creep her out. She'd know about this obsession that her brother has. She'd probably assume that Augie had either like collected these specimens from cats or like some of the nobles had caught them during their hunting rounds and given them to Augie. There's no reason to assume that Augie somehow masterminded, caught, captured, and killed these birds. It's like a lot of birds. And even if Augie had somehow managed to catch, capture, kill, and dissect all these animals all by himself, uh, I don't think in that time period where they used like dead birds on hats and where they had them like as decorations in the home that him trying to figure out the mechanics of the birds would have been like the tipping point that it is played as. And I should say it doesn't even go with the characters as established within these last episodes. Larvinia has this whole speech later about how she wanted to like go fox hunting. Her dad wouldn't let her so she mapped out all the dens for where the foxes were. She got up early ahead of the hunting party and then like killed the fox 
in front of all the people, mostly so she could show that she like was 100% the boss man, ruined their own fun, but she is vicious and mean and has no issues with ending animal life. And how Larvinia is disabled is a significant harm to Augie's character as well. The whole time he's being portrayed as someone who might be neurodiverse in some way, shape, or form. And then to portray him as the villain in Larvinia's disability and like to imply that he has a hidden darkness and this hidden darkness is now like rising up in him as an adult and he's gonna kill Larvinia from it. Like all of that awful being like the villain and exactly like every other bad neurodiverse stereotype we have in Hollywood. It's super sloppy. It does a huge disservice to who Augie is and what he does in the first six episodes. And I don't even like Augie's character that much and I was offended on his behalf. What the hell is going on with Malady? I do not understand. In the first couple episodes with Malady we see that she is a serial killer but also has some kind of like internal knowledge or or something about the Glanthe. We never really get a solid grip on what the heck her turn is. It feels like it keeps changing as is best convenient. I know that she becomes like invincible through pain, but the fact that she can also like sense the Glanthe and talk to the Glanthe and know where the Glanthe is and can do like all these other things just has so many extras. I thought where we were going with Malady's situation was that she was one of the travelers who had came with Zephyr and the Glanthe originally. But the same way that it took Zephyr a long time to sort of like come to terms with that, it took Sarah a long time to sort of figure out all of that stuff too. And she had like the additional negativity of her lobotomy time with Dr. Haig and like torture experiment with Dr. Haig, like all that like combined to leave her kind of confused, but also sort of having a goal and knowing what's going on and coming at it from a different angle. And maybe even intentionally coming at it from a different angle, so like being the backup plan in case Zephyr's plan A fails. But but instead of doing that, she's just like very confused in the back episode. She randomly appears to like fight with Zephyr over the Glanthe. They both get Glanthe eyes. And when that happens to Malady, she goes back to being Sarah, goes back to her husband, gives us all those insights that had been strongly implied previously about her home life being abusive and terrible. She has a final confrontation with Mundy, where Mundy decides to let her go because he decides she's more of a victim than a criminal, which is bullshit. FYI, you can be both a victim and a criminal at the same time. They're not like on a spectrum of one or the other. But number two, Malady is a serial killer. Like there's no amount of harm that can have befallen you that makes your serial killing okay. And I'm sorry, you're not going to give her some kind of redemption arc or make me feel super bad for her in the back half of a story. It seems like she's either killing for pleasure, personal power, or some kind of convoluted something. I might have felt differently if she had been truly insane. But we have that reveal in episode 5 that she is very cunning and has a tight-knit intense plan and a whole like coven of followers. I'm usually all for a redemption arc but this just is entirely unearned and doesn't make any sense. Malady gets a lot of screen time in the back six episodes and none of that time makes any sense in general. She's just like this dangling thread of mayhem and confusion. I don't know what she's gonna do next. I don't know why she's gonna do it. No catharsis there. Additionally, I feel like the show missed a huge opportunity to show fanaticism on both sides of the spectrum. In episode 6, where we go to the future and we see those two different sides fighting the war, came off as looking as like fanatics and extremists. Some of those loudest voices create these world-ending wars that just span generations and time and become too big to manage. And I would have really liked if we saw the mayhem in London as a chance to do that again. In this case, I think it would been really easy with some of the stuff they set up. Like for example, after Malady is hanged in episode 5, episode 7 jumps into how a bunch of the peasants and lower class people are in an uprising and are using the visage of Malady as like their new person. So there's a bunch of like little Malady lookalikes running around and dancing and cackling and destroying stuff and generally rioting. In that way I felt like the show really understood Malady becoming a symbol for the 
oppressed and powerless and like her own ability to sort of like get her own justice even as the upper class kill her. Really speaking to the lower class and moving them to rioting or protests and mimicry could have been taken to an interesting level of fanaticism. And then on the other side seem to be like the working class and the upper class. We have obviously Lord Matheson still trying to get rid of all of the touch people or make it so touch people can't rebel. We also have like some pure human fanatics or whatever or some seriously anti-touch people and they use like biblical verses and they're also gathering and rioting and hurting anyone or killing anyone who's identified as a touch person. It would have been really cool if these two sides had ended up going like, up against each other. Instead we do get like the classic kind of weed in like young girl like yelling and being a crazy fanatic and out for blood against the touch people and she was cool. She was really intense and fun and like willing to like keep pushing boundaries and extremes in a way that was engaging and fun to watch but there's nobody on the touch side doing the same thing. The purists for whatever reasons think that the touched are inherently a threat to them and have to be eradicated at all costs and the touch people believe in the power of the Galanthi leaning into that and that somehow doing that the Galanthi will be able to save the world and like these two at odds positions really clashing and going up against each other and going to the highest level of extremes would have been really interesting and engaging. The biggest misstep to me in the whole Never show. The whole reason these two episodes exist. Why the hell has the Galanthi become a Jesus space shrimp? I don't understand. This whole time we've been hyping up the, the Galanthi came originally to future world specifically to save the human race and to redeem people. And they had like a power or an ability, a knowledge, an insight, something that was going to make it so humanity stopped fighting itself so we could all like kumbaya and get along and like, I don't know, ascend to more knowledge or like a better stage of life. It's been very confusing and like a huge open question how all these different powers that the Glanthi gave to 1890s London could ever hope to achieve that. And obviously the showrunners had no idea how they were going to close that in a single season, which I empathize with, but their solution to this was to make the Glanthi Jesus. It hatches from its egg, it's reborn, and then it sacrifices itself to redeem humanity of all its sins. In doing that, it creates even more spores and even more people will become touched. But how does that save humanity or fundamentally change humanity? It seems like it just gives humanity more weapons with which to harm itself. You know, I could see a world where if this was a multi-season show, these powers would be used to like slowly solve problems, help improve the state of humanity as a whole or like maybe they go through time traveling shenanigans and stop key moments or world hopping times where they can intervene as a neutral third party because this isn't their dimension. There's a show there somewhere that would be interesting or there's like a continuation of fighting over the Galanthi and whether or not its existence is worthwhile but the show we have doesn't do that and the Galanthi dying and creating more spores it's like just perpetuating the problems that we're already seeing in 1890s London. Like it's ample that instead of making it better. And in that way it kind of proves that the blood purists who didn't want any touch people to exist because they were making the world more dangerous and a worse place for everyone makes them right in a lot of ways which is awkward at best. All of this to say, the back half of The Nevers is terrible. It does tired, reused storytelling we've seen a million times. It changes characters to make them less interesting and compelling. It completely drops some stories, like even Lord Matheson or Mundy. It feels like a little bit they fell off the face of the earth in the back half of these stories. Mundy gets an arc where he gets back together with Swan right before Swan dies. That's a barrier game trope just for the sake of having one I guess and it doesn't really solve Mundy's looking for the truth, looking for a better London. We finally get to find out what happened to Lord Matheson's daughter. Surprise, surprise, she's a touch. She's keeping down in the basement. We already sort of kind of knew that and where they go with that story in an episode and a half is not fulfilling. Swan's character, his whole arc is just not happening or coming together. I would have really loved if we had taken Swan and his fair 
Berryman story and he had been like the B team to the touched A team. They observed that the orphanage is being left unattended because Zephyr and Penance are out doing their thing and they come in as like a backup or like another kind of shelter to you know keep the rest of the touched together and keep them like in a defensible position. But as it stands we just sit at the end of the Nevers feeling hollow and lifeless. I think about the first half of season one, the passion, the creativity, the attention to detail, the thoroughness of the episode, and the costuming, and the design, and the character work. And then I look at the back six episodes and I just think, what was it all for? Every decision made in the back half of this series to me is truly baffling. The fact that Zephyr and Penance are no longer friends, Augie murders his sister, Swan and Mundy get back together so Swan can die in a bury your gaze trope, Lord Matheson dies without ever getting any resolution on his daughter, and Myrtle randomly turns into the electric lady while Malady gets to be free and redeemed. What did I watch? Why is this the ending? Even after watching these back episodes several times now to make this video, I really don't understand how we got here or how these became the creative decisions of this team. And maybe this is just the fate of shows nowadays because there are so many streaming services all trying to hold our attention at the same time. They start 90 million things and they all go to terrible ends because they never truly invest in any one thing and they understand that none of us have the attention span, interest, or ability to follow it all. It felt necessary for me to give this show some kind of goodbye. There was so much about it I really liked and wanted and the end results were so different than where we started from. Did you watch The Nevers? Are you trying to find a way to watch the back half of the season? Tell me in those comments down below. And if you have nothing else to say, go ahead and leave me a clock emoji to let me know that we're all running out of time. Thanks for watching, and as always, keep reading. Bye!